Stanford University. Good evening, uh, and welcome to the second of two evening symposiums devoted to examining the great Tohoku earthquake of March 11th and the ensuing tsunami and nuclear crisis that followed the uh, seismic shock. I'm Dan Snyder, the Associate Director of the Shorenstein Asia Pacific Research Center here at Stanford, uh, which is part of the Freeman Spogli Institute for International Studies. Uh, this symposium are co-sponsored by the School of Earth Sciences and the Freeman Spogli Institute. We're all, I think, still trying to absorb the magnitude and meaning of an earthquake that dwarfed anything seen in Japan, a country that is known for seismic activity, probably for more than a millennia. Last night, we had three excellent presentations to help us understand what happened and what lessons we may draw from those events. Uh, the first looked at the seismic event itself and what happened from a geological perspective. That was followed by a discussion of the engineering dimension of the disaster, looking at how buildings and infrastructure fared. And finally, there was a presentation on the ongoing crisis at the Fukushima nuclear power plant and its implications for the future of nuclear energy use. Tonight, we will begin as well with what happened seismically and what it may tell us about what could happen here in California. And this evening, we'll focus perhaps a little bit more on the aftermath of the Great Tohoku Earthquake and what it portends for the recovery of Japan. We have three renowned experts, each of whom will speak for about 20 minutes, followed by a question and answer period. And this event, as was the case last night, uh, is being webcast, and uh, both evenings will be available as well uh, to be viewed on U uh, Stanford YouTube and as uh, downloaded as podcasts. We will begin tonight with Ross Stein. Ross Stein is a prominent and widely cited geophysicist with the U.S. Geological Survey here in Menlo Park. He received his doctorate, I should note, here from at Stanford University. Uh, he's been working on seismic, ri seismic risk, seismic hazards, and earthquake science for several decades. And among his many accomplishments, he's written and appeared in numerous award-winning documentary films on this subject. Tonight, he'll speak about what happened seismically in Japan, on where large damaging earth, uh, aftershocks are now more likely, particularly uh, in the Tokyo area, and why the superquake was unforeseen. And he'll reflect on what unforeseen quakes may lurk under our noses in California. He'll be followed by Lori Johnson, who's the principal and founder of Lori Johnson Consulting and Research. She has over 20 years of experience in urban planning and disaster-related consulting, management, and research. She's written extensively about the economics of catastrophes, land use and risk, and disaster recovery and reconstruction. She studied most of the world's most recent major urban disasters, including the 2010 Chile earthquake, the 2008 uh, major earthquake in China, uh, the 1995 earthquake in Kobe, Japan, and she was one of the authors of the recovery plan for New Orleans after the uh, Hurricane Katrina uh, disaster. Tonight she'll discuss the response and early recovery efforts in Tohoku, looking at how Japan manages disasters. She'll examine the prospects for long-term recovery from the earthquake, including comparisons to Japan's uh, experience with earlier earthquakes such as the Kobe quake. And finally, she'll look at some of the early lessons and insights for response and recovery planning in California from a similar catastrophic earthquake. And finally, uh, we have my colleague Masaoki, who is a professor emeritus of Japanese studies in the economics department here at Stanford and a senior fellow at uh, the Institute for Economic Policy Research at Stanford, as well as at the Freeman Spogli Institute. He's the former president of the International Economic Association and the Japan uh, Economic Association. He's written extensively on numerous subjects, but uh, very much on the Japanese and Chinese economies. Uh, Professor Aoki has just returned from Japan, and he'll speak tonight about the economic consequences of the disaster on Japan's GDP, on global supply chains, uh, on international currency coordination. And he'll also discuss the, the response of Japanese society to the disaster, as well as the response from both government uh, and the private sector to the multiple events, particularly the ongoing crisis at the Fukushima nuclear power plant. Uh, I, uh, I'll stop right there and move right into Mr. Stein. Okay, so here's my pledge. I'm gonna start and end with a picture of a boat on a building.
I want to acknowledge the very important collaboration that I have with Shinji Toda, brilliant researcher at Kyoto University, and Jin Lin, and we did this work together. Now, what is truly remarkable about this earthquake is its massive aftershock zone. A few decades ago, we used to think that aftershocks illuminated the site of slip. But as you can see here, this is clearly not true. The aftershocks extend well to the north and south and well off into the ocean to the east. And in addition, there are these kind of oddball aftershocks way out here, very far from the other clustered, which suggests that perhaps they would have some other origin. But one of the remarkable features of an earthquake in Japan is its unprecedented monitoring capability. So we don't just have to restrict ourselves to magnitude five aftershocks like here. We can look at magnitude one and larger shocks. And when we compare the rate of magnitude one aftershocks after the March 11th main shock to what happened before, we can see that in fact the entire part of central Japan turned on. So any warm tones in this image are places where the seismicity rate increased. In other words, aftershocks. Blue regions are where the seismicity rate decreased. And what you see is this very widespread region over which the seismicity rate has turned on. And this is really an amazing uh, image and one that we could not have made after the great Sumatra earthquake, just to scooch bigger, or the Chile earthquake, because we can't even see aftershocks larger than about four and a half for either of those earthquakes. So this is what you get from great monitoring. And it raises questions, how and why are these earthquakes turning on? And it provides answers. Those isolated aftershocks well to the west of the main shock are really part of this broader aftershock sequence. They're not really isolated at all. They're just the largest aftershocks among the many, many that are occurring. Now, if we look at the kind of slip, the nature of the slip that occurs in these aftershocks, what seismologists call focal mechanisms, we get these beach balls. And the beach balls simply tell us the ones on the left are what we would have expected. Those are your well-behaved children. They line up when you ask them to. And these are the events that are consistent with this plate being shoved under, the specific slab being shoved under your, uh, uh, the Honshu, the island of Japan. And that's why they have that kind of red on one side and white on the other character. The ones offshore, above the word high slip, are places where the plate is bending and being pulled apart as a result of this earthquake. They're tensional events. But the oddballs, the one on the right, are completely unforeseen and full of things that we never would have expected. And among them are up to a magnitude 6.6 .6 earthquake, very shallow, tensional earthquake that ruptured the surface in a 30 kilometer long rupture. And as you can see, these extend well outside in different directions. Now, what this provides for us is a great opportunity to test the theory of Coulomb stress transfer, that we can use this earthquake and its slip to calculate where we've increased the stress on surrounding faults and where we've decreased it. On the basis that where we've increased these stresses, we have brought other faults closer to failure. So to do so, we conducted a test where we look at the half a dozen or so models of the distribution of slip on this fault. And we make the assumption that if this model were correct, all the aftershocks should be places where the faults have been brought closer to failure. So in this picture, if the theory were right, all of these little balls should be red. Now you can see most are red, but certainly not all. But that's really not a good enough test. If you were a medical researcher, you'd say, no, I don't just want to know that if you give you the drug, you improve. I want to know what your improvement rate is over giving the drug as a placebo. And our placebo is, or control group, if you like, is calculating the same thing for all of the shocks that occurred before the main shock, because they should be unaffected by it. And as you can see, they're about 50-50 blue-red versus more than 80% red for the aftershocks. And what this emboldens us to do, and we think justifies us to do, is to use this stress transfer hypothesis to calculate all the, for all the surrounding faults in Japan, which are now brought closer to failure. And that's what I'm gonna show you next. So here is that picture. We've muted the colors on the megathrust itself, so they're kind of the pastel colors. And all the surrounding faults, you can see, if they're red, we calculate that they've been brought closer to failure by a significant amount, by a bar or more. And by the way, I can put a bar of stress on my hands 
just by making a 45 degree line here and pushing as hard as I can. This is not a lot of stress, but this seems to be what's involved in turning on and off earthquakes on faults. So you can see that there are areas to the north and to the south where you saw some aftershocks that have turned red. This outer rise area has turned, turned red. Most of the major faults in Tohoku should be brought farther from failure, that's very good news, and part of the Sagami Trough, another subduction zone on the other side of the triple junction. Let me just zoom in here, but before I do so, I want to make perhaps the most important statement I can tonight about aftershocks, the shocks that might occur on these faults. There are two durable features of aftershocks that we see everywhere. First is they decay very rapidly in time. The frequency of occurrence of aftershocks decays not only rapidly, but in a very predictable, regular way. If we look at the frequency of aftershocks in the first day, 10 days later, it'll be one-tenth of that. 100 days later, it'll be one-hundredth of that, et cetera. So it's a very rapid decay in time of aftershocks. Okay, that's the good news. The bad news is the magnitudes of those aftershocks do not decay at all. And what that means is if we look at the range of magnitudes in the first day, we'll see the same range of magnitudes the next 10 days. And we'll see the same range of magnitudes stretched over the next 100 days, et cetera. That means there will be no all clear sounded for this earthquake. We are going into a period of a very long vigil in which large late aftershocks could certainly occur. Now, if you don't believe me, reflect on the 2004 Sumatra earthquake, a magnitude 9.1. Three months later, it was followed by an 8.6. In the succeeding seven years, we've had four just above or just below magnitude 8 earthquakes. So it's continuing there. It could very well continue here. So now let's zoom in in the region around Tokyo. I want you to understand that what Tokyo is to Japan is what New York, Washington, and Chicago are combined to the United States. This is one quarter of Japan's population and the center of virtually everything. And Tokyo was moved, the capital of the city was moved, of the country was moved from Kyoto to what was formerly Edo in 1600 because of its vast fertile plain and also because of protection from typhoons and tsunamis. And the irony of this environmentally sound decision on many bases is it subjected this capital to a much higher earthquake risk than there was in Kyoto. And as a result, Tokyo has been all but destroyed in 1703, in 1855, and in 1923. So Tokyo always has a high probability of earthquakes. The question is, is it now higher than it was before March 11th? And the answer seems, in my judgment, to be yes, because the off-boso portion of the Japan Trench is now uh, brought closer to failure. What we call the, the Kanto fragment underneath the city is farther. We have a San Andreas-like fault here, which is brought closer to failure. We submitted this uh, figure for publication on April 7th. Since that time, we've had two large earthquakes closer to Tokyo in the region that turned red. Now, we can also look at the history of Tokyo to see that this kind of successive earthquakes are not uncommon here. That great earthquake in 1703, the Genroku earthquake, historical earthquakes in Japan are named after the former emperor at the time, this earthquake, probably about an 8.4 or so, occurred along what's called the Sagami Trough, and it was followed four years later by an 8.2 or so in the Tokai area of the Suruga Trough, and a little over a month later, Fuji erupted. That could happen again. A half a dozen volcanoes, active volcanoes, in the central part of Tohoku have seismically turned on since this earthquake. So this is yet another possibility um, and we have had, since this earthquake, a magnitude 6.2 shock at the base of Mount Fuji. So this is all part of the possible futures uh, that, unfortunately, Tokyo must now prepare for. Of course, Tokyo is the best prepared city in the world for earthquakes. Nevertheless, it seems to me that its future is, uh, is more uncertain than it was before. Uh, Greg. Barroza talked last night on how and why this earthquake might have been missed from the Japanese. 
project. Here is the Japanese national hazard map. The red areas are where the, the map predicted high rates of shaking, the green areas low rates. And I've superimposed on this map the uh, larger damaging earthquake, 6.8 and larger, in the last 10 years. So in fact, that even overlaps uh, the map by five years. And unfortunately, you can see that they are almost anti-correlated. Now, maybe what we're really able to see here is that we're not doing a good job about predicting where earthquakes should be because Japan has three times the length of our history and three times the speed of our faults. So compared to California, you're looking at 10 times the record. So probably in a decade in Japan, you can tell you're not doing well. We can't even tell we're not doing well here. So it's important not to be smug about this. Nevertheless, they made some decisions about where they thought earthquakes would be more likely down here and where less likely here. It's also interesting to note that there is some kind of cluster in the seven or eight years before this main shock in the region that eventually ruptured. Is that some kind of foreshock sequence? We really don't know, but we do know that that does not always occur before a great earthquake. So if it occurred here, it's not durable. It's not something that we can depend on. Did anybody do better? It's interesting that Jan Kagan at UCLA publishes an automatic online forecast every night on his website. This is the picture that I withdrew on April 18th, but it looks about the same on March 10th. And you can see his high hazard area is off the Japan Trench. This was the epicenter. And the lower hazard area off the Sagami Trench or Nankai Trench. So in other words, his seems to be much closer uh, to what we've seen. This is one man's work just basically smoothing this 40 years of seismicity, seismicity versus this very massive uh, Japanese effort by the government uh, that seemed to get it wrong. Well, did anybody get it right? And, and that's a very tricky question to ask. In the top two papers, you can see that what these people are telling us is that we should never assume a subduction zone, a place where, the, or where an oceanic trench is stuffing itself under a continent cannot produce a magnitude nine or larger earthquake. And I, I have to say that from the, from the post March 11th judgment, these people were prescient. And I hadn't appreciated how right they were. And Rob McCaffrey makes it very clear in the abstract and to a non-scientist, that's the summary statement for the paper. Now the bottom one is very interesting. If you read the title, you don't have a clue what their main point is. And if you read the abstract, you still don't. But that is the last sentence of the conclusion that I've shown there. And here, Hiro Kanemori, Kanemori and Jim Mori have really come closer to anybody else in getting it right and seeing it beforehand. They said, look, this subduction zone is locked. Stress is accumulating. And these earthquakes that have occurred aren't big enough to remove that stress. Therefore, there must be large earthquakes infrequently out there. So in newspaper terms, they buried their lead. And it's an interesting thing, why did they do that? And what's even more interesting is uh, Hiro Kanemori was quoted in Science a couple of weeks ago after the earthquake saying, um, I never thought this kind of event could happen here. And in fact, he said, well, the earthquakes uh, were large enough that I wouldn't have expected this. Essentially retracted this. You know, in the United States, when an event happens, everybody jumps up and say, I predicted it. Here in Japan, the person who predicted it jumps up and said, I didn't. I think this is a social difference. This is the value of harmony over strife, over thinking about the, the, the welfare of everybody versus the importance of, of, of pointing out the quality of your own prescience. And it's a very uniquely Jap Japanese uh, characteristic, which will probably be very valuable for them during their recovery period. So what kind of retrospective can we draw from this event? First, uh, Japan's long history was misleading, and they're not alone in this. The Wenchan earthquake in China in 2008, a magnitude eight, the Chinese had no idea that these faults could link up together and produce an earthquake of that size. Similarly, the 1990, the 1992 earthquake landers, again, three mangy faults that linked up together and produced a 7.3 in California. New Zealand, a large earthquake very far from where they thought the active, active area would be. A fault that existed but they didn't know about. So the Japanese are not alone in this. And this is also interesting. As geologists, we believe that the past is the key to the future. And 
when we have a deep past like we have in Japan, we place a lot more stock in it. But it's misleading because even our deep past isn't long enough when we talk about very rare, very large events like this one. And of course, Tokyo, in my judgment, is not out of the woods. And that's unfortunate, but that seems in, to be a, something that we have to contend with. So what about us? What are the events that we haven't imagined? What are the events that we haven't allowed ourselves to consider as the Japanese did not allow themselves to consider the possibility of a magnitude nine on this boundary? I want to show you three in my judgment where we may have missed the boat, and I'm choosing them in part because just to make it more interesting, they involve nuclear power plants. <laughs> so here's the first one. Offshore from Point Conception all the way to the Golden Gate, we have what's called the Hosgri and San Gregorio Faults. You know, faults don't know their name. So even though we gave them different names, they can rupture together. This is a continuous feature. Diablo Canyon Power Plant lies there. And in the California hazard model, we permit up to a magnitude 7.74 earthquake. If this entire fault were to rupture, that would produce an 8.2. And if it did rupture, it would impart stress to the northern San Andreas, which could take off from there, and then we could get an 8.4 to an 8.5, significantly larger than any earthquake we've envisaged for California. Now, of course, if this were to occur, it would be very, very rare. But I can see no good argument why we're not considering it, certainly in retrospect. OK, here's another in my rogues gallery. Uh, in Southern California, we have the Rose Canyon and Newport Inglewood faults. And the California model does consider that they could rupture together and gets the magnitude, in my judgment, pretty close to right. But when we begin to think about this earthquake, fault or this fault next to the San Onofre plant, we, we have to ask ourselves, are we ready to cope with the simultaneous damage to two of California's major cities, San Diego and Los Angeles, and any consequent faults that could be uh, fired off by the stress transmitted on the ends of that rupture? I don't know the answer, but I don't think we've really thought about two great cities uh, reeling from that at once. And finally, uh, perhaps the uh, the, the biggest dragon to slay is the idea that, that I believe, have believed, and I think most of us do, that the northern and southern San Andreas faults cannot rupture at once. The reason we believe this is because they're separated by a 100 and 120 kilometer long section that creeps, that slips every day, and doesn't produce earthquakes, and we're pretty sure it hasn't produced an earthquake for 10,000 years. So we would say, okay, that separates them. But if you put an eight on the southern San Andreas, which is arguably more due than northern San Andreas, you could easily transmit a half a bar of stress to the locked part to the north. And that could trigger an event on the other side of that decoupling zone. So the question we should be asking is, can we falsify that hypothesis? Do we have dates that show for historical earthquakes that they are not the same? And even for the most recent, the two most recent, uh, the penultimate Southern California event in the late 1600s, we haven't dated the Northern California event close enough to know if that occurred at the same time. So it seems to me here is yet another magnitude 8.4 earthquake we haven't considered at all. It may be highly unlikely, but it needs to be part of the discussion. And it seems to me to confront such a scenario, there's nothing to fall back on but a little gallows humor. And so on that, I'd like to make good on my pledge to uh, begin and end with a picture of a boat on a building. And here it is in Singapore. Thank you very much. <laughs>going to speak about response, recovery, and the early um, insights we have to reconstruction for this event, looking back at some of the lessons um, Japan had after the experiences they had after the 1995 Kobe earthquake. Um, some of the statistics um, from this event, I won't run through them in great detail, but what's important is we've been watching the numbers climb for weeks and weeks, both in the, um, the death toll and the number of missing. What we just finally saw in the past week was that number of missing finally started going down. So the final death toll of this event is much more likely to be somewhere around um, the combination of these two numbers that you see here, 24 to 26,000, some of the estimates are. 
Um, autopsies have been done of a number of victims, and um, there's some pretty alarming insights, which are certainly going to be influencing the way Japan responds in thinking about this event and also its reactions to um, risk management around the country. The first is that 92% of the victims died due to drowning, and 65% of the victims were more than 60 years old. These are very interesting in the sense of um, what happened after the 1995 earthquake. Um, about 70 or 80 percent of the victims actually died from building collapse. And Japan reacted, um, as we often react to various disasters, um, with a number of pieces of legislation really focused on, on identifying the areas that were vulnerable to a severe sh shaking, providing more money and incentives uh, for doing building retrofits to strengthen the wood frame structures that, that were most vulnerable to the kind of collapse that happened. Um, I would expect that we'll see similar reactions in this event um, to addressing the tsunami risk in Japan. Um, what's also striking is, is the number of victims that were more than 60 years old. This is actually very consistent with what happened in Kobe and what happened in the Niigata earthquakes of 2004 and 2007. Japan is an aging society, but still this is statistically um, skewed from the age distribution um, and again reflects that people are unable to get away, don't have access um, to the same resources, and in this case, um, the ability to run. Um, or get up to a higher elevation area. The injuries are quite low, which is not typical for an earthquake that we have a lot of shaking. You would have a more um, sort of a consistent distribution between injuries and deaths. So again, this is really because so many people were caught up in the tsunami and it was um, much more either alive or, or dead. Um, the sheltered population numbers have varied quite um, up to about 170, 180,000 people, some estimates have been. There's about 3,000 shelters um, across Japan. Um, so these are a lot of people that are inside shelters. This is, again, very high, and it really reflects that people really had nothing left to live in, no place to take shelter, even um, in a partially um, damaged house because there were so few. Um, and then there's also the nuclear incident in which this number, the, the numbers vary depending on who reports what statistic. Um, but another 50,000 people or so have been impacted by the evacuations required for the nuclear incident. The heaviest damage um, has been concentrated in three prefectures that are north of the Tokyo area that, that Ross referred to. Prefectures in Japan are administrative boundaries of the national government. They're sort of like counties are to states in that they function and carry out very administrative uh, functions of the national government. Um, but they're the size of counties in a way, um, but they have very dense populations in most of them. But the three prefectures that were most impacted were, were some of the less densely populated area, uh, Tohoku being less densely populated than central Honshu. But there were many other prefectures impacted. So this was an area that affected a vast, vast region. There were a number of fires. This isn't something that we'll know much about because so many of these were put out by the tsunami, but the National Fire Administration estimates there were over 300 fires. This is um, very concerning to those who model fire following earthquake, and we, can, we don't really have that many good examples of this, and, and we continue to struggle with uh, getting those models accurate, and that is very important to us here in California. Um, there were over um, 70,000, or about 70,000 buildings that totally collapsed. Um, another 25 or so thousand that um, have, um, have collapsed and another 200,000 that had some damage of some level. What's really interesting in this earthquake is the amount of land that was lost. This is an area that has been um, subsiding, facing coastal uh, erosion and, um, and um, low-lying land uh, for, and for a period of time. The tsunami impacted this area and also something we call co-seismic displacement took place. And so as part of the actual earthquake event, a, a lot of the land actually went down in elevation. Um, so a huge amount of area, 138,000 acres of land was lost. Now this is across a vast, vast area, so it's um, mostly concentrated within about a five kilometer zone along the coast but it's, a, it, it's going to be a significant issue for uh, rebuilding. In, um, in terms of response, 
Japan has a, um, a, a, a national law that sort of engages the way we have in America where there's a disaster declaration process, so to speak. And Japan actually um, engaged its national emergency management headquarters within the first hour after the earthquake. And then within two days, it had done the, its disaster declaration of um, a disaster of extreme severity, which has various um, significance to them um, at a national level in terms of how they organize and react. They don't have what we have, which is more of a civilian agency like our Federal Emergency Management Agency. Um, instead, they rely heavily on their self-defense forces to carry out a number of functions, including search and rescue, mass care, and a, a lot of logistics related to access and um, road, um, road openings, et cetera. Um, our forces have joined in in support of that, um, as have any, many other um, countries and search and rescue teams from around the world. Um, they also have mutual aid among firefighters, um, police, and that will even work its way through into recovery among road repair crews coming from other parts of Japan um, all the way through. So they rely extensively on a, on a government mutual aid among the prefectures. They've had medical assistance teams. Volunteer organizations usually play a very big role in supporting the shelters. Um, these are organized within communities, just like we have within our faith-based communities and other NGOs, and, in, um, and they're very active. But these organizations have been impeded in this event, mainly because um, access has been limited, and the search and rescue issues and the health and safety issues have been so extreme. Um, over 100 countries have responded, as well as many um, national, international NGOs. So what are some of the response challenges? Well, certainly the geographic extent um, and the concentration of devastation within a tightly compacted area has really made it very difficult to access in any way to provide supplies with the roads, the railways, airports, and port damages, all impacting you know, all various abilities to bring supplies in. Um, debris has been a major issue, as well as just, um, just the, the access from all of these, um, these, the, these impacts. They've had a very protracted search and rescue. They just tried to scale that up a few days ago to try to complete the human uh, recovery um, and so that they can move to the next stage. Um, there's been mass care and life support issues, um, the logistics of just getting supplies into the area. So many of the, the shelters were opened. They're designated like we have designated shelters here, but they weren't able to get supplies in to take care of people. Um, many people have relocated to get away from the impacted zone if they could, or many cities have been offering to take people if they can, if they can transport them to other parts of Japan. So this map here actually shows the locations of shelter populations across Japan. The heavily shaded red areas are, of course, concentrated in the, um, most people are still within the impact area, but you can see many people have moved across northern Honshu as well as Hokkaido. Um, and this is causing significant life disruption to those communities, to families, um, and um, everyone who's having to be relocated away. And then again, we still have the nuclear incident, which is complicating everything. Now looking ahead to recovery, um, Aoke-sensei will probably go into more detail about the economics, so I won't, I won't spend a lot of time here. But the loss estimates from this event are still um, quite vast in their range, and these ranges will tighten up over time. This is quite typical. Um, but there are some estimates that the economic losses from this event could be to around 200 billion US to maybe as much as 500 billion US. These are numbers comparable with Hurricane Katrina plus. Uh, we really, in the US, don't have experience with an event this large. Um, this doesn't include all the impacts, the economic impacts from the nuclear incident as well as the rolling blackouts. Um, I, uh, the insurance industry will be, will be providing resources for recovery. Uh, these loss estimates, too, are still um, quite variable, and the ranges will tighten up um, as insurers actually begin to process claims. Uh, but the property losses might be as much as $40 billion um, to the insurance industry, and life might be anywhere from you know, up to maybe $10 billion uh, U.S. All of these numbers I've converted to U.S., um, so the, what this really says to those of us who look at this is that there are resources that are kind of come from the private sector, but there's still a significant gap that has to be that has to either be come from individuals and their own personal resources. Um, it'll just be lost revenue, lost income to to families, to businesses, um, or the the governments uh, at various levels will have to pitch in and help. 
Um, and so that's what's starting to happen. In, in, on March 11th, I mean April 11th, uh, one month after the disaster, the, the national government set up a committee for recovery framework, which will have recovery authority and responsibilities at all levels of government. They're to focus on developing reconstruction strategies, relocation strategies, and also promoting um, mitigation and green um, um, construction, reconstruction. I'll talk a little bit more about that. The national government anticipates its reconstruction costs might be as much as 240 billion US. The first supplemental funding uh, was requested in the diet. Um, it, it'll go to the diet this week. They anticipate this first supplemental about be about 50 billion US. Um, and again, this number, they're expecting more, more financing to be needed over time. The national government anticipates that it's going to have to build about 70,000 temporary housing units. Um, it has a goal of trying to do 30,000 by the end of May. Japan is very good at this, but still one of the challenges is getting the resources and getting um, roads opened and getting um, um, the materials into the area. Re re restoration reconstruction challenges. Well, certainly, as Ross has talked about, this event was not anticipated, and so there's going to be a lot of reflection about what standards for building um, and rebuilding. There should be mainly what ground shaking level should be anticipated for, for structures, but also the tsunami related building standards are going to be challenged. Um, many of the tsunami protection structures were overtopped in this event. Um, so they're going to have to think carefully about that and land use will be an issue as well. This is gonna be a problem within the impact area and it'll impact the ability to recover in a speedy way. Um, but it's also going to be a problem across Japan as they reflect on assumptions made everywhere else. Um, there's over 25 million tons of debris that must be removed. This is just from the buildings, the estimates done by satellite imagery. Doesn't include build, uh, debris from ports, cars, and ships. Um, so this number is gonna go way up. This is twice the amount they had to manage after the Kobe earthquake. This is a huge volume of material that has to be carted away and, and managed. Relocations, consolidations, Redevelopment are all likely to happen and will require time to complete. As I mentioned, the land loss is going to be a significant issue. There are agriculture and port functions as well as all the supporting communities and businesses. Um, tremendous human and economic losses mean that there are gonna be constraints on doing, being able to rebuild cost effectively. When you've lost so many people in a community, does it make sense to run all of that infrastructure back out to that small village for a, a much smaller population. That's where the relocation and consolidation is likely to take place for service provision uh, purposes and to create communities that are viable. But those are not easy things to do. Um, some other challenges is that the local governments themselves have been devastated. Many of them have lost their facilities, all their records, land tenure records, um, everything, your vital records would all have been lost in an event like this um, if that building was gone. Um, there have been long distance evacuations. This is all gonna disrupt the community level organizing and implementing of recovery. Um, there have also been a number of problems of national leadership and financing already. Um, there's been a lot of political instability and turnover at, at the cabinet and, and the prime minister level in Japan for a period of time. Many are commenting that this is uh, reflecting their ability to, to organize and to execute policy in this event. Um, and there will be protracted economic impacts when Japan has already been facing some economic challenges. Um, there are gonna be many, many changes in legislation and new policy adopted for disaster management, for land use, for engineering and construction and for financing. This is what we do. We react to these events. We go through deep introspection. We did it after Hurricane Katrina. We do it after large events. It's when we may make some of our big leaps forward in disaster management policy, but it takes time. And it definitely impacts the people who are trying to rebuild. So just a quick, some bit of reflection on Japan's experience. They do have a lot of experience in recovery and rebuilding. The most likely event they're going to be looking to, um, which has some differences though, is the Kobe earthquake of 1995. Um, about 200,000 buildings were damaged, about 6,400 people died, about 400,000 uh, people were left homeless, uh, about 200,000 or so needing shelter. Um, fires were a big issue. There was widespread utility damage, road damage, um, and the losses were, these numbers again, um, are never really known, but over 150 billion US. 
But Kobe was a very concentrated area. This is the Osaka, Kansai region of Japan, one of the um, probably the second most heavily populated area in Japan outside of Tokyo. And much of the damage was concentrated in a belt um, along the waterfront of Osaka Bay and, um, and very dense, um, dense development in those flatland areas. Kobe undertook a rebuilding process very, very aggressively. Um, and already the timelines are quite different from this event. Within two weeks after the earthquake, um, they issued a two month moratorium on all new construction. The first step they did in planning was within two months after the earthquake where they issued decisions about areas where they would have focused policies for recovery and rebuilding. They selected these based on damage as well as um, they had just recently gone through a city master plan update. So they had already been looking at these areas as needing economic revitalization or, or building um, an infrastructure investments. Um, they what they did at that stage was basically just draw the boundaries and set out some basic principles. What were they trying to do within these focused areas? Were they trying to widen roads? Were they trying to um, add parks, et cetera? Then they did a more detailed uh, planning where they involved the community. And finally, they finalized the plan and they did carried out a number of relocations. Um, in, in, in this, Japan honored all the rights of those who held rights to land, to structures, and were tenants. And many of those configurations are quite different in Japan. You might not have all three as we typically do here. Um, so this is just the map that the city, actually where they were defining the boundaries of these different project areas. They had two mechanisms they used, uh, redevelopment and readjustment. Um, and this just shows you some of the stuff that they did. This is a readjustment area where they were mainly focused on widening roads so that they wouldn't have the impact of debris, um, maybe adding parks so they had places to go to in the event of fire. Um, and this is a redevelopment area where they really focused on changing land uses um, and, and creating a more economically viable neighborhood. This is a model of what they had anticipated up at the top, very tall towers, housing towers. Um, and then the recession was ongoing and some of that never got built. This is an image of that same area in 2005. My point really is to show you that these processes are very long. 10 years after the earthquake, they still hadn't completed these. Most of the area had recovered in, 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 to some extent, but these areas that are focused for, for this kind of detailed action um, take much longer to do. One of the things they did do was fund planners to work with the neighborhood organizations and helping them work through these processes. And we expect that all of this is going to happen at some level in Tohoku, um, in these communities that are gonna be most impacted. Already the planners of Kobe, those who were involved in this are up and working with planners and with prefectural and city level government. So some early insights, and then I'm quickly gonna be over, I promise. Um, it's a country with an excellent track record of preparedness, but they hadn't anticipated the magnitude of this event. There are cascading effects of what we call a super catastrophe here that are leading to this protracted response, these escalating losses, the far field effects, and an impeded transition to recovery. Um, and this recovery is gonna take a commitment um, that has to be sustained and financed over a very long period of time of 10 plus years. What does this mean for a next Bay Area earthquake? Are we planning for the right hazards? As Ross just raised, do we really know if we have the right issues? Our cascading effects are not necessarily tsunami, but they are fire following earthquake. And they're not necessarily a nuclear incident here in the Bay Area, but they certainly could be an impact to the Delta levee system or other major infrastructure piece. Do we have the right plans? Are we up to date with all the plans? Do we have the right resources? We've been steadily decreasing our insurance take up in California. We may not have all the money that we need. Um, and do we have the right governing structures and institutional capacities in place? And with that, I will turn it over to Aoke Sensei. Um, good evening. Um, <clears throat> today is a day uh, when uh, <clears throat> a disaster in uh, Chernobyl uh, happened uh, exactly uh, 25 years ago. And as you know, uh, uh, this uh, disaster was not just an uh, engineering or a technological disaster, but uh, which led to uh, finally demise of uh, Soviet Union, um, which the, uh, mobilized uh, half a million uh, people uh, almost in unprotected uh, to clean up the disaster. And uh, also, uh, they, uh, at the time, uh, uh, Soviet government tried to hide, manipulate uh, lots of information 
but uh, uh, this kind of a regime uh, became uh, unviable, uh, also because of very high cost of uh, uh, cleaning up. So uh, uh, this kind of disaster has a very significant uh, uh, social and uh, institutional uh, impacts as well. So uh, I'd like to uh, uh, discuss uh, a little bit about uh, this aspect of uh, uh, this disaster. Uh, here, uh, some of the uh, information is uh, already given uh, by uh, uh, Dr. Johnson, and uh, so uh, I don't need to uh, uh, repeat this, but uh, uh, this uh, human losses, the uh, uh, who is missing or died. One uh, interesting additional information is that uh, casualty of uh, school kids, of uh, uh, grade school and uh, also uh, high school kids were very uh, small, uh, only uh, a little bit more than 1% uh, of uh, these uh, uh, casualties. And the loss of uh, physical assets, uh, uh, again, uh, uh, Dr. Johnson is uh, right, and uh, given the fact that uh, uh, Japanese GDP is uh, uh, approximately uh, $6 trillion uh, last year, uh, this loss of uh, uh, infrastructure is, uh, uh, accounts for the, uh, about uh, 3 to 5 percent of uh, uh, GDP, uh, which is uh, uh, quite a uh, big one. Um, this uh, area, uh, Iwate and Niigata and Fukushima, uh, this area, uh, <coughs> the population share is uh, about 5 percent, and uh, uh, GDP share uh, is uh, uh, four percent, but still uh, uh, this is a relatively uh, <coughs> scarcely populated uh, area and less industrial activities. But still, uh, uh, this uh, disaster has a significant uh, economic consequence. Uh, first of all, the uh, along the coastline, uh, uh, particularly in 1960s, uh, uh, very huge the steel plants and also uh, uh, petrochemical factories were uh, built uh, because uh, this uh, coastline was, uh, has uh, easy access to uh, sea transportation. And so uh, coal and the iron ore from uh, Brazil and uh, Australia and Poland and so forth uh, were uh, brought to uh, this uh, coastline and manufactured the uh, uh, steel products and uh, uh, petrochemical uh, products. And uh, now uh, they uh, uh, provide very high valued sort of a steel plates in uh, automobile. And uh, <clears throat> uh, in March, the uh, automobile production of uh, Japan was uh, reduced by uh, uh, almost half. The, uh, like uh, Toyota and Nissan, Honda, Suzuki, all these uh, companies' uh, total production was uh, uh, reduced by half because of a uh, shortage of uh, uh, supply. As you know, uh, automobile uh, assembled uh, something like uh, 10 to 20,000 uh, parts, and steel is uh, uh, one of these, but also uh, uh, like uh, <coughs> important uh, semiconductor the, uh, uh, equipment for uh, <coughs> produce and, uh, uh, and so forth is uh, also uh, stopped, the supply of those uh, semiconductors stopped because major uh, factory uh, uh, producing this, like uh, uh, <coughs> uh, Lunesas uh, uh, Electronics is uh, uh, located is there. And also, uh, uh, you know, iPad, uh, you have a glass the uh, surface, and uh, under the, behind the glass surface, uh, there is uh, actually a uh, uh, <coughs> circuit is uh, printed, and this uh, uh, equipment for uh, printing this uh, circuit is uh, also produced a company uh, <coughs> of uh, subsidiary of uh, uh, Nikon, uh, which is a uh, whose uh, <coughs> plant is uh, located in Sendai, and uh, uh, this uh, company produced uh, 95 shares of uh, uh, this uh, equipment and so forth. So, uh, and also uh, uh, another uh, product, uh, which is very much hard, is uh, uh, lithium uh, iron uh, batteries, uh, which is also uh, important for the production of uh, the uh, uh, electric car and so forth. So uh, already, uh, uh, not only uh, uh, Japanese uh, manufacturing, uh, car manufacturer, 
but uh, also uh, Ford company uh, stopped operations in uh, next uh, a week or two in uh, their Chinese uh, factories. And also, uh, um, uh, this uh, Tohoku area is uh, very important in uh, uh, fishery and also uh, agriculture. And 40% uh, uh, of uh, uh, 39,000 uh, fishing boat was uh, uh, missed. And uh, also 25% uh, of uh, uh, electric power uh, uh, supply uh, was uh, 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 also uh, stopped uh, to uh, uh, Tokyo area because uh, this uh, Tokyo Electric Power Company, uh, TEPCO, uh, so, uh, they uh, have a 17 uh, nuclear plant uh, in this area, and uh, 13 of them uh, stopped operations, and uh, also uh, uh, some other uh, uh, six uh, summer uh, plants uh, uh, stopped uh, operations and uh, so forth. But one of the uh, uh, interesting uh, uh, economic activity was uh, the, uh, in the area of uh, ICT. Um, television uh, <coughs> broadcasted uh, the uh, uh, information and the analysis of a specialist uh, for 24 hours uh, uh, continually, and this provided uh, the uh, uh, up-to-date information to uh, uh, citizens, and also uh, uh, of course, uh, people try to uh, uh, reach their families and friends to find out their uh, awareness, and uh, uh, it was uh, very difficult uh, for them uh, to uh, connect by uh, uh, telephones. But then uh, uh, Google's the uh, immediately tried to set up uh, kind of uh, the uh, 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 site uh, for uh, uh, finding uh, people, uh, so-called the uh, Google Person Find. And they set up this uh, uh, for uh, within uh, two hours, and 400,000 uh, people uh, used uh, this site to find their friends and so forth. Um, <coughs> international uh, reactions, uh, uh, quite a bit of uh, international aids are now giving to Japan, and it is estimated that uh, Japan is going to be the uh, largest donor recipient country uh, in this year. Uh, including uh, 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 small children in uh, very poor uh, islands uh, in uh, Pacific Oceans and so forth, uh, also uh, provided uh, grants to uh, uh, Japan. And manpower and technical uh, assistance, uh, this was already uh, mentioned, but the uh, uh, United States they sent 19 uh, Navy ships and uh, 18,000 uh, uh, soldiers. This is uh, quite a bit of uh, uh, deployments of uh, people, and uh, also 150 Marines uh, nuclear crisis uh, uh, response team uh, was uh, uh, sent to uh, Japan and uh, coordinated with the Self-Defense Army. They left Japan uh, just uh, uh, several days ago, uh, uh, thinking that the uh, situations in uh, Fukushima uh, power plant is uh, uh, somewhat uh, uh, stabilized. And France and, uh, also uh, engaged in uh, uh, cooperations over treatment of uh, uh, contaminated water, and Russia uh, also sent the uh, extra uh, supply of uh, natural gas and so forth. And also, another interesting uh, uh, coordination was uh, in the area of uh, uh, currencies. In, uh, throughout uh, 2000, the uh, central banks of uh, G7 was uh, a commitment to uh, a sort of known interventions in uh, uh, currency uh, uh, exchange uh, uh, interventions. But then uh, uh, after uh, March 11th, all of a sudden, March 17th, uh, just before uh, 6 o'clock, the uh, uh, when the uh, uh, market opens, the uh, Japanese yen started to rise the, uh, from uh, $1.83 to uh, uh, 76 
uh, within the 30 minutes or uh, something like that. When a uh, uh, country like, uh, well, Japan is a hit this kind of a uh, problem, uh, you would expect that uh, Japanese yen would uh, rather uh, depreciate. So this uh, phenomenon is, uh, of course, the uh, 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 caused uh, by uh, uh, speculations of uh, hedge funds and so forth. But then uh, uh, this time, the uh, G7 is uh, very quick in intervening uh, in this market, and the Japanese yen was brought to a more stabilized uh, uh, level. And uh, so this is uh, uh, one of the interesting uh, uh, aspects of uh, uh, international uh, cooperation uh, this, uh, this time. And this eruption of uh, global supply chain, I already uh, uh, talked about this, but uh, uh, I mean uh, this uh, impact is uh, going to be felt the uh, more uh, maybe uh, uh, from now on because the, uh, um, the <coughs> immediate the, uh, reactions of our productions was uh, uh, was uh, to use uh, you know, inventories and the sofas. But uh, as I said, uh, some of the problem is uh, uh, like uh, uh, disruptions of uh, uh, provisions of uh, equipment uh, rather than uh, 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 productions. So uh, uh, this uh, uh, problem may be uh, felt uh, sooner or uh, later. Well, uh, <clears throat> Question is, uh, is this uh, just a uh, natural uh, disaster? The uh, people's uh, 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 the foreign observer the, uh, uh, regards that the people's behave very uh, calm and uh, ordinary uh, behavior and so forth. And also, uh, as suggested, uh, uh, well, the uh, earthquake resistance building cause and the architectural engineering uh, fairly well uh, <coughs> uh, face this uh, uh, disaster. Uh, for instance, uh, in Tokyo, now they are building the uh, uh, world's tallest tower, uh, uh, which is uh, for uh, the uh, television's uh, um, uh, web uh, the dispatch, and this is going to be uh, uh, 2,000 uh, feet high. And uh, at March 11th, it was almost to be completed. And many workers is uh, the, uh, working on uh, uh, this uh, 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 as high as uh, uh, 2,000 feet, but uh, uh, there's no casualties and so forth. And uh, after a few days, uh, uh, this uh, tower was uh, almost uh, completed to uh, uh, up to the uh, top. But then uh, um, this is a better side. But uh, the question is, uh, uh, <clears throat> uh, impacts of uh, uh, this, uh, uh, well, uh, elements of uh, human failures uh, in uh, this uh, uh, accident. As you know, uh, the problem of uh, Fukushima, the uh, uh, nuclear plant, is that the, uh, uh, when an earthquake hit, the uh, reactor uh, was uh, safely uh, stopped. So uh, um, after the, this uh, earthquake, the uh, government came to uh, uh, cabinet, the uh, uh, secretary came to the TV, and uh, uh, this uh, nuclear uh, plant was safely uh, shut down, so uh, don't worry, and so forth. And then tsunami came, and meanwhile, the, uh, because of an uh, earthquake, the uh, power supply was uh, destroyed to uh, uh, this uh, um, uh, plant, and then um, back up the uh, diesel engine was uh, uh, located rather close to the sea level, and this uh, back up the uh, 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 diesel, uh, diesel engine was uh, also uh, destroyed. So a power source to cool off uh, this uh, uh, <coughs> uh, <coughs> uh, to uh, cool off the uh, so-called decay heat after the, uh, this uh, uh, radioactive uh, action is a, a stop, was, uh, became a problem, and then uh, 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 this uh, <coughs> heat is uh, built up, and uh, through the uh, interactions of uh, water, chemical interactions of uh, water, and uh, 
uh, minerals uh, which covers the uh, nuclear uh, fuels uh, generated uh, uh, so, uh, uh, the uh, uh, hydrogen uh, the, uh, gas. So there is a danger of uh, uh, <coughs> this uh, uh, hydrogen uh, the, uh, explosions. And so uh, uh, this uh, earthquake or uh, the uh, tsunami hit uh, uh, afternoon of uh, 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 <clears throat> March uh, 11th, but uh, toward uh, uh, midnight of uh, that day, uh, all the year, uh, uh, this uh, uh, risk of uh, uh, hydrogen uh, explosions was uh, uh, imminent. So uh, there's uh, many story now uh, about uh, uh, who was uh, wrong about prolonging uh, so-called uh, the, uh, the open uh, um, uh, bent cap to release uh, this uh, uh, hydrogen uh, into the air. Uh, government says, well, they recommended to uh, 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 bend as soon as possible around uh, uh, midnight, and uh, then uh, 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 TEPCO was uh, rather slow uh, to do this, so uh, Prime Minister uh, jumped on a helicopter and went to a site uh, in the uh, morning. And then uh, uh, the government claimed that uh, uh, instead of uh, suggesting, they ordered uh, TEPCO to do the, this vent uh, opening. The uh, political enemy of a prime minister says that uh, because a prime minister flew there uh, in the morning, the uh, TEPCO was afraid to expose prime minister to uh, uh, radioactive uh, the uh, uh, materials, so uh, they postponed uh, this uh, the uh, event. And then uh, another story is that well, during night, the uh, uh, engineers at the site has to work uh, under the blackout conditions. And when they do, if they do uh, this uh, release of uh, hydrogen gas, they have to estimate what is the uh, impacts uh, on people uh, by uh, uh, checking uh, uh, directions of uh, 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 wind and so forth. So there are lots of uh, stories and uh, uh, conflicting stories and uh, we'll uh, never know the, uh, exactly what happened in a short period of time, but uh, there is uh, uh, quite a bit of elements of a uh, human uh, kind of uh, the uh, uh, elements uh, in prolonging uh, this uh, uh, vent uh, 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 and uh, that uh, led to uh, uh, explosions of uh, uh, hydrogen gas. And then uh, also uh, <clears throat> about these uh, failures of uh, power source, not only a regular power source, uh, the, even uh, this one was not uh, expected, uh, but uh, the uh, uh, power supply was, uh, <coughs> regular power supply was uh, uh, suspended, and then uh, uh, diesel engine was, uh, uh, didn't work and so forth. But <clears throat> so uh, uh, TEPCO and also uh, uh, Atomic uh, Safety uh, Commission people say that uh, this kind of uh, the, uh, uh, ask this magnitude of an uh, uh, earthquake was uh, unexpected uh, and so forth. But then um, actually uh, 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 this uh, uh, well, ex uh, the uh, uh, specialist of uh, uh, Atomic uh, uh, Safety uh, Commission says that uh, this uh, level of uh, the earthquake was not uh, really within the uh, range of uh, uh, considerations of four uh, possibilities. In Japanese, uh, it was not, uh, uh, it was a uh, the uh, out of the range of uh, uh, considerations. But uh, actually, uh, uh, there was the uh, 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 earthquake and the tsunami of a uh, uh, same uh, magnitude, the uh, uh, so-called Jokan uh, earthquake and the tsunami in uh, year 869, uh, which was uh, referred to uh, yesterday. And uh, uh, recently, uh, quite a bit of uh, research is uh, uh, progressing uh, about uh, this uh, uh, historical record of uh, uh, earthquake, particularly geological studies uh, in um, taking out the sort of uh, uh, <coughs> uh, samples of uh, earth 
strata uh, by uh, uh, using uh, uh, coring, and they discovered the, uh, uh, they checked this kind of uh, uh, samples, and they uh, now know that uh, uh, this man uh, same magnitude of uh, earthquake and uh, uh, tsunami uh, happened uh, really in uh, nine uh, centuries. And uh, <coughs> this is only one uh, uh, picture which I show, but this is a uh, uh, simulation uh, uh, result by the National Institute of Advanced Science and uh, uh, Industries. And uh, scholars from uh, this uh, institute and uh, from the uh, University of Tohoku and so forth warned that uh, uh, this uh, uh, level of earthquake might be uh, also possible in uh, Tohoku. And this was uh, discussed within uh, uh, some meeting at the Ministry of uh, International Trade and the Economy last year, and, uh, but the, uh, TEPCO uh, didn't respond uh, to uh, this uh, discussion, uh, unfortunately. So, uh, um, well, why are these kind of things happen? Here, the, uh, I point out some organizational backgrounds uh, in Japan. TEPCO is a regional monopolies, uh, which is uh, different from uh, American UTD companies, and uh, TEPCO uh, provides uh, uh, air supply, uh, the uh, electric uh, supply to uh, Tokyo metropolitan area, uh, to almost two million uh, companies under 26 million uh, household, and their sales is a uh, 15 billion US dollars worth uh, in uh, last year. And they integrate the uh, uh, generations of uh, electricity uh, through the nuclear plant or a traditional uh, thermal plant, and also they uh, uh, control all the networks of uh, transmissions of uh, electricity and also they distribute uh, this uh, power to a household and uh, companies and so forth. This is a huge, uh, uh, most powerful sort of uh, uh, companies uh, in Japan. And, uh, but within uh, these companies, there is a group of uh, people called uh, Nuclear Village. And uh, this is an uh, entrenched group of uh, uh, elite uh, nuclear energy specialists and uh, they are sort of uh, insulated uh, from uh, other uh, segment of uh, uh, companies. But at the same time, top management has never been the uh, uh, nuclear energy uh, specialist. And then at national level, no effective sort of uh, separations uh, between uh, 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 national industrial policy for uh, energy development and uh, uh, safety regulations and monitoring. The uh, agency uh, which supervises the uh, safety of uh, this uh, plant, nuclear and industrial safety agency, and also uh, agency for natural resource and energy, which is uh, responsible for uh, uh, policy making and implementations of uh, energy policy is under the same uh, ministry. Uh, or ne namely Ministry of uh, International Trade and uh, uh, Industry. There are two uh, commissions. One commission is a uh, 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 national, uh, uh, let's say atomic uh, energy uh, commissions. This is a uh, uh, five uh, member small uh, commissions used to be chaired by a uh, uh, minister, uh, the uh, minister, but now uh, uh, it is a uh, uh, now chaired by a uh, 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 private citizen, but the, he is uh, uh, actually an uh, ex-bureaucrat of uh, uh, Ministry of uh, International Trade and uh, Industries. And then uh, there is a uh, uh, separate commissions, national uh, 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 nuclear uh, uh, safety uh, commissions, which is uh, chaired by uh, uh, professors of uh, uh, atomic uh, energy uh, in, at the University of Tokyo, and uh, this commission is uh, uh, staffed by uh, professors from uh, University of Tokyo, University of Kyoto, and Nagoya University, and so forth. They are scholars, but they lack sort of a practical knowledge. They send many uh, former students to uh, TEPCO, 
and also uh, the uh, uh, companies like uh, Toshiba and uh, uh, Hitachi and so forth, they hold a very close uh, network, uh, which has uh, become a uh, basis for uh, uh, this uh, nuclear uh, the, uh, so called village. And also, uh, uh, they receive uh, quite a bit of uh, uh, research funding uh, from uh, uh, TEPCO. So, this is a uh, 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 one of the uh, problems for uh, uh, nuclear policy making in Japan. And so, uh, general, uh, I'd like to uh, draw a few general lessons. One is uh, general principles for uh, the complex system, like uh, uh, nuclear energy management or risk management, uh, so forth, is uh, to divide the uh, whole complex system into uh, functionally uh, uh, specialized modules and risk them, uh, li link them with an uh, open, uh, transparent uh, uh, interface uh, rules. But uh, Japanese systems is uh, characterized as the uh, following. Each entities, like uh, uh, this uh, atomic village, uh, nuclear village uh, within the Toshiba, uh, uh, I mean uh, TEPCO, and uh, uh, other uh, sections of uh, uh, the uh, uh, same companies, each entity maintains a very high degree of uh, uh, autonomy. And uh, uh, while connecting with and uh, constrained by uh, implicit, only, uh, with uh, implicit uh, share, shared norm uh, without clear uh, rule for uh, uh, leadership and so forth. So the use of uh, specialized knowledge and uh, expertise are compromised. Uh, at the case, uh, at the big shocks uh, in uh, this kind of uh, uh, system. So uh, this disaster may or may not be a good chance for uh, uh, institutional reform uh, in uh, Japan, uh, comparable to uh, major restorations or a post-World War II uh, reform, whether uh, it would become a case or not. It depends upon uh, also uh, political will and also uh, uh, um, the uh, uh, people's will. And uh, if that is the case, uh, maybe one of the policies uh, uh, disbundles the uh, uh, varied uh, uh, functions under uh, TEFCO and uh, uh, relate them with a much more clear uh, social risk and uh, uh, transparent mechanisms. Uh, by this way, the uh, uh, more open use of uh, uh, power exchange, the, uh, like a you know, market, uh, rather than uh, 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 planning of uh, outage uh, proposed by uh, uh, TEPCO, and uh, also provides uh, incentives for uh, innovations of uh, uh, alternative uh, uh, energy sources and so forth would become uh, uh, important. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm going to ask the speakers all to take a seat in the front here, and uh, we have about 20, 25 minutes for uh, questions and answers from the audience. As much as possible, we would like you to use the microphones. There's one in each aisle here, just because it's easier for all of us to hear your questions. If you, I think we all heard that, so cross. Both are good questions. A silent earthquake is one in which the fault is slipping slowly enough that it doesn't generate seismic waves. And there's plenty of evidence, particularly in Japan, that these earthquakes occur and can reach sizes of nearly magnitude eight. And part, part of the place where these have been discovered is in the Japan Trench. So some faults seem to be ACDC. They can produce earthquakes, sudden slip, and also slow slip. Our Hayward Fault is one that does the same thing. Now the second question was... Uh, that's very, very tough call because aftershocks are getting spaced out farther and farther in time. And so it's hard to ever tag an aftershock as one beast or another. And in fact, if I just looked at two shocks and I took them out of the context of where they occurred and when they occurred, nobody could tell them apart. No one could say, oh, that's an aftershock and that's a foreshock or anything else. So what we rely on is looking at the rate of earthquakes that occurred in that region beforehand, and then judging when the aftershock decay reaches that same rate again. And typically, 
that's about a decade in a fast moving fault system like this one. And in the mid-continent of the United States, it's probably a couple hundred years. And it's probably why we have earthquakes today in New Madrid. This is for, Lur for Lurie Johnson. After Katrina, there was an awful lot of debate about whether we should you know, rebuild in the same places that people lived before, and communities were very engaged in, in that process and, and quite you know, reasonably wanted to return to home. Um, is this same uh, set of discussions, do you think, going to go on in, in parts of Japan that uh, where perhaps uh, cities shouldn't be residing because of the threat of tsunami? Uh, is this an ongoing discussion, do you know? There have been um, recently a few, a few instances where there's been some discussion about setting back from major areas um, uh, for tsunami protection. I'd imagine that there will likely be more in areas not impacted by this event. Um, in the areas impacted, I think what's different from Katrina is that um, we've had such complete wholesale destruction. Um, instead of having structures, having slabs, having some you know, part of the structural membrane still intact with a flooded building, these buildings have been completely removed in most cases. Um, and infrastructure has been heavily damaged and there's been so much life loss so the, I think it's going to be a very different issue of um, trying to create viable communities, um, as I mentioned, and how that will be determined. Um, you know, part of it will be dealing with the natural landscape and risk associated with rebuilding in certain locations. They've had ongoing issues related to, as I mentioned, erosion and subsidence. Um, and you know, part of it will also be just what is viability from an economic um, standpoint and just for general life recovery um, and for the functions of those communities, depending on how long the, you know, the process takes to, to reassemble people and get going with recovery. Many, many businesses may choose to relocate or have made some other decisions to, to, to leave the area. Um, just as happened in Katrina and happens in many places. So, you know, it's a, it's, a, it's a lot of moving pieces and very dynamic process. And the plans that'll get made will probably have to change over time just because the recovery will take so long, like what I was showing in Kobe. Some of the plans you draw up in the beginning, um, the economic conditions change, the money changes, people change their mind. Um, so it'll be a very dynamic process. I had a couple of questions related to losses, economic losses in recovery. Um, and maybe Laurie and May Massa, you could comment on the, the two interrelated points. Laurie, you had mentioned some numbers that the estimates are up like to $470 billion losses, I think it was on one of your slides. A slide or two later, you said that the Japanese government expects to spend $240 billion in recovery, and there was like $40 billion perhaps in insurance. So that leaves a gap of $200 billion. You know, so my question is, will that gap ever be filled? And, and a different but related question, maybe Masa, you could comment on, the, the loss in supply chain that you talked about in manufacturing. Um, of course, that causes a, a temporary disruption to manufacturing around the world, but is there a danger that other countries are gonna fill that gap before Japan can rebuild to fill it? You know, in other words, will that business perhaps be lost forever or for a long time? Uh. I actually want to answer the second part of the question first. <laughs> but but um, the, when it comes to economic losses, um, it, these numbers are very fuzzy. And what typically um, a government is focused on at first is trying to understand what the impacts are going to be to the national economy, um, to the various levels of government, and what they would, uh, whether there are resources within existing programs. Um, and budgets of ministries or that they're going to have to pass some additional legislation, uh, we do the same thing here. And so the initial estimations are often very, very focused. You might even have international agencies like the World Bank or the International Monetary involved. If it's a, it's, if it's a developing country like Haiti, you, you saw a lot of estimates going on. Um, and over time, we don't have as many institutions that continue to track those uh, total numbers. So there are what we typically call direct economic losses, which relate to the damage itself, as well as anything that we could see that is directly related to the damage. So um, it, it, that, that could be business interruption, that could be um, additional living expenses that people would require. So there are some metrics that we use to, to look at the actual 
um, structural or building damage, um, physical damage, and then relate some additional amount to come up with this idea of what we call an economic loss. There are also indirect losses, um, which sometimes are included in those estimates and sometimes are not. And that's why you see some of the big ranges here, because these ranges are also in part looking at the nuclear incident um, as well and putting some of that into it and some are not. So, so this will all constrain a little bit with time, but at the same time, there aren't as many institutions that are gonna keep doing it. It's all part of the process of trying to come up with the right financing at the beginning and figure out what they need. So, so that's kind of a long explanation of economic losses. Um, insurance is definitely a key piece in recovery and to have 25%, let's say, of the total loss financed by insurance is, is a good number, but it's not, a, you know, it's not a major number. It's not what we see often after just wind-related hurricanes um, will have much higher numbers of, of insurance paying for that loss. Um, after the Northridge earthquake, we had insurance covering you know, over 25% of the loss. And if you looked at the homeowners in the central, um, in the San Fernando Valley where the epicenter were, almost 60% of homeowners were insured. Um, so you had a really big cash infusion. So when I look at the numbers, I'm looking at it from the standpoint of recovery and how much money is gonna be coming in quickly from sources that we already have versus how much is either gonna have to go through a political process um, and have people vote or, or taxation and other issues that are gonna come into play in Japan as they try to figure out where they're gonna get the money. What was different in Kobe is that the, the event happened in January, which was I think just about two months before the national, what the national budget actually starts April 1st. In Japan? Yeah, the, the fiscal year starts April 1st. So it was actually perfectly timed to do the kind of loss estimating and get something into the next year's budget. This event was actually too late. Most of the budgets had already been submitted. And so this is a very different process for Japan to deal with than what it dealt with in Kobe. Like all the wheels, everybody had already confirmed the national budget for next year. And so now they're having to go back and look at supplemental requests, look at eking money out of existing programs. Um, um, and, and you know, it's very similar to some of the things you've been following since we've had the recession in the U.S. and we've been dealing with our budget crisis in California. So they're going to have to figure out how to come up with money, um, and they're looking at a whole range of ideas for that. In Kobe, there were pieces of the economy that were lost forever to, to kind of set the stage for... Um, for some additional comments. The, the one I want to point out is the port of Kobe. It took them a very long time to reconstruct the port. And some of the dynamics of the port were already in play where it was moving away from being a container-oriented port. Um, but that, that really shifted significantly during that delayed process of rebuilding. And so Kobe actually lost a major part of its income because the city, the city itself of Kobe owned those facilities. So as, as a revenue generator for the city, it was hit very hard. As an example, New Orleans was hit very hard by losing tourism and convention business after Katrina. San Francisco would equally be hit really hard by losing that kind of business as people said, hey, we're not gonna have our convention there, the area's impacted, people aren't gonna be able to get to Fisherman's Wharf, et cetera. So you do see huge economic displacements. Well, about the uh, um, <clears throat> global supply chain, as you know, uh, Japan was uh, renowned for so-called uh, just-in-time method in uh, 1980s, let's say. And as I said, in uh, automobile productions, uh, uh, tens of uh, thousands of uh, parts has to be uh, assembled, so a supply has to come in just in time. Kind of. and, uh, but this kind of uh, mechanism was uh, uh, advantage over this uh, mechanism was uh, quite a bit lost, in my view, in 1990s and the 2000 because of the uh, development of uh, IT. And uh, uh, so uh, other manufacturers uh, try to emulate the uh, same mechanism by the use of uh, uh, IT. So uh, rather than uh, um, this kind of uh, uh, coordination uh, mechanism, contents of uh, this uh, 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 supply chain becomes uh, very important. So I quoted the example of uh, this uh, uh, printing technologies for glass space for, uh, uh, let's say, iPad. Uh, these uh, uh, products can be made now in, uh, let's say, by Samsung or uh, probably uh, China and so forth. But uh, what the uh, Japanese manufacturer, Nikon, the uh, supplies is uh, equipment to, uh, um, to uh, print uh, this uh, 
uh, grass space. And uh, their market share is, uh, for instance, 95%. And uh, this kind of a technology cannot be emulated uh, by uh, uh, other uh, economies so quickly. And so uh, now uh, uh, the uh, emphasis is a shift from uh, just in time to method to uh, maybe a just in case <laughs> method. And uh, so uh, how much you uh, uh, make inventory and so forth. So uh, like uh, those uh, manufacturer has uh, the, uh, a particular abroad, the uh, uh, China and the Korea and so forth, they have a little bit of inventories. But now the, uh, if this uh, supply of uh, equipment is, uh, uh, is uh, slowed down, and then effect is uh, coming up uh, maybe uh, uh, later toward the end of this year or something like that. So uh, the Japanese automobile uh, you know, company was hit very hard already in the 1930s, but they gradually come back. And probably uh, uh, this uh, supply is uh, prioritized to uh, domestic uh, you know, uh, company and so forth. And uh, so uh, this uh, international impact uh, may be uh, coming a, a bit later. So uh, this uh, equipment of printing is uh, one example, but also uh, uh, semiconductors for a hybrid car, let's say. This is uh, also uh, a very large uh, shares of uh, uh, the production is uh, also uh, uh, in Miyagi. But uh, one of the ironies is that uh, the Toyota was, uh, their manufacturing basis was uh, concentrated in Tokai area near Nagoya. And then uh, in 1980s, uh, at one point, there was uh, some fire uh, in uh, some suppliers, and this uh, fire disrupted uh, uh, this smooth supply of parts. And also there is a, a kind of a prospects of a, a risk of a Tokai great earthquake and so forth. So, uh, uh, Toyota and other companies started to diversify the, this uh, manufacturing basis of uh, suppliers to a particular Tohoku or Kyushu uh, because they thought that uh, this area is uh, less vulnerable to uh, uh, earthquake and so forth. But uh, actually, uh, uh, the, the, those uh, suppliers was uh, uh, hit very hard this time. So, uh. Yes. Uh, this question, uh, can everybody hear? Yeah, this question uh, relates to the probability of uh, earthquake in California because of the Japanese earthquake. The thing is, uh, considering plate, you know, in the, in the context of uh, plate tectonics, is there any effect at all in the faults in uh, California due to the Japanese earthquake? And if so, is there stress relief or stress buildup? Too far. And the, the possible exception is that this earthquake did trigger some very, very small kind of pseudo earthquakes on the San Andreas system. And so you might say if that's occurring, then there is some small probability increase uh, of a larger earthquake. But this is so exceptional and so small, the distances are so great, I really don't think personally that there's any connection. There is a debate in, in the community on that issue, and there are people uh, who are, are spokesmen for the other point of view, but they're wrong. <laughs> Sorry. Um, is there one thing that keeps you up at night that you don't think uh, us in California are ready for? The next David, big one? My best shot. <laughs> uh, retrofitting our water system and the de Delta levees. Yeah, good one. And I would add fire following. I have two. Yes. My question is to uh, Professor Aoki. Uh, in, your general, in your general lesson, uh, at the last part, you said it may be a good chance for Japan, Japan to, to change drast drastically, which happened in 19th centuries or just after, the, after the World War II, but it may not. And personally, as a Japanese, I'm desperately hope it will happen, but if uh, uh, the question one is, why do you think it may not happen? And question two is, uh, when, uh, uh, what's, uh, what we need to make it happen? Thank you. Okay, uh, <clears throat> I, um, as an example, I uh, took the uh, uh, 
uh, possibility of uh, <coughs> disbanding uh, the uh, uh, big monopoly of uh, power industry. There, there are, in Japan, is uh, divided into nine regions, and each region is monopolized by uh, one power companies. And uh, as I said, uh, they have uh, you know, in, in enormous power by uh, uh, controlling a whole network of uh, distributions. The, uh, that provides a, a quite a bit disincentive for a small um, business to uh, develop the uh, uh, alternative uh, you know, energy source and so forth. So actually, um, early uh, 2000, around 2002, 2003, the uh, Ministry of uh, International Trade and Industry uh, tried to deregulate this uh, power industry. And at the time, I was a director of a research institute for uh, this METI, so uh, I'm very much familiar with uh, uh, this process. The idea was uh, <coughs> breaking the, uh, <coughs> uh, this uh, integrated uh, uh, business uh, between uh, the uh, uh <coughs> Uh, power generations and uh, also uh, be, be between power generations and uh, distributions. But uh, be, because of very strong resistance uh, from uh, uh, industries, even the powerful METI uh, at the time, uh, this uh, uh, the regulations uh, effort uh, was not uh, successful. And uh, this uh, monopoly uh, continued. And, uh, uh, I, as I said, uh, one of uh, human, uh, major human elements of uh, this disaster, uh, particularly a disaster at the nuclear plant, is uh, somewhat related to uh, uh, this kind of institutional uh, uh, defects of uh, Japanese system. So uh, I think this is a very good chance uh, for Japan to start uh, talking about this. And, uh, uh, but it, it's not really uh, clear yet whether uh, we are able to uh, uh, have a grand vision of uh, institutional reform, not only just uh, you know, power industries, but uh, uh, for instance, relationship. <coughs> uh, well, the Japan only a uh, year and a half ago, the uh, uh, two party systems have become uh, really uh, uh, <clears throat> de facto, uh, uh, effective, uh, not, not effective, but uh, these are two party uh, 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 competitions uh, become finally uh, in, uh, uh, introduced, but uh, still last uh, year and a half, uh, LDP and uh, also uh, DPJ uh, fighting each other the, uh, with the small things uh, like uh, uh, the, <clears throat> uh, try to review the uh, uh, scandals of uh, other politicians with uh, rather minor uh, you know, uh, content. And uh, Japan is uh, uh, also uh, now uh, facing a very important phase in the sense of uh, uh, aging of uh, populations. As uh, we discussed in the Tohoku area, the 65% uh, 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 of a casualty is uh, you know, older people. And, uh, uh, this is uh, different from the uh, Second World War when the population was uh, still you know, very, very young. And many farmers and uh, uh, also fishermen are very old and so forth. So this is uh, uh, also a problem. How to deal with uh, this uh, problem of uh, the uh, aging of uh, populations is a very important agenda of uh, Japanese politics. And uh, for this, uh, uh, how to uh, overhaul the uh, uh, social entitlements, uh, <coughs> systems of pensions and so forth is uh, you know, very important. And for this, uh, I think, the, uh, in spite of, uh, uh, or because of uh, these uh, two-party systems, uh, I think the, uh, uh, there uh, should be a more of a process of uh, compromising and uh, uh, a cooperative effort or a competitive effort to uh, uh, to uh, figure out uh, what could be uh, a good entitlement systems and you know, so forth. And this ha ha hasn't been in, uh, in shape yet in the last one year and a half. So after this uh, you know, earthquake happened, there, there's uh, some slight hope for grand coalitions and so forth. But then uh, some politicians started again uh, accusing uh, these uh, you know, prime minister's actions. And uh, well, the, uh, he may have some uh, you know, personal problem and so forth, but uh, as I said, uh, the, uh, he, uh, whether his uh, action was right or not was, uh, 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 is not clear uh, yet and so forth. So uh, I think the, the, this uh, political will is very 
important. So uh, it really depends upon uh, you know, uh, what would happen. But there's a very uh, strong consensus among the you know, uh, ordinary people that uh, Japan has to change with this uh, uh, disaster as a, uh, as a springboard. Let me take uh, one last question, the uh, man and gentleman standing there. I'm just curious about uh, maybe your estimate about how complete the assessment of lifeline damage might be, especially, say, in areas where there's still so much debris. Um, and I'm assuming things like schools and roads would have been covered by your numbers for the amount the government was going to have to fund. I don't know whether, you know, gas lines and electric lines and sewers and stuff like that would be included in that, or if those are private companies that will then have to uh, rebuild those systems. Um, and is there going to be financing available for doing all that? Um, where's the money going to come from, do you think? Um, you know, how realistic are the numbers now? Are the assessments, you know, too soon to really know how severe this could be? And, you know, that's not even counting the, the relocation costs, and I don't know what their equivalent is of unemployment, but if the businesses aren't there, then you can't work. Um, I can maybe we could share this real quick. Um, the, the, in Japan, the national government actually funds a large part of the public infrastructure financing. And that is a big part of what they're trying to estimate. How much surveying and actual knowledge of lines of lifelines, you know, water pipes and sewer pipes, um, is still unclear. Um, an exception to that would be those assets that are privately held um, and those distribution systems that are privately held. And then those are basically covered by the, by, the, by the companies, in this case like TEPCO for damage transmission and distribution lines. That would be part of their responsibility. Um, so a large part of their early estimation will be working with all the various national agencies to come up with estimates of highway reconstruction costs, um, sewer and water uh, line reconstruction costs in particular. Electric, electric and gas tend to often be held, ha handled separately by private companies. Um, and so I think at this stage, they're doing a lot of this work now actually by satellite imagery, not necessarily going out and doing field surveys and doing estimations based on um, areas damaged and knowledge of systems and, um, and, and impacts to plants, processing plants, et cetera. So some of that's work's going on already, um, even remotely, without having to actually be in the physical locations. So yeah, I don't know if you wanted to add something about. Um, related to this question, uh, I think the uh, probably a relationship between the central government and the local government uh, is uh, going to become one of the issue. Yeah. And uh, in case of a uh, Kobe earthquake, uh, the um, prefectural government and also city government uh, is uh, fairly strong and uh, also they are innovation, sort of innovative oriented and so forth. But in this case, the uh, uh, three prefectures are involved and uh, heavily, uh, sparsely populated and uh, uh, lots of uh, old people and fishermen and uh, farmers and so forth. And how to reconstruct those regions uh, cannot be dictated by uh, central governments or even the prefectural level. Maybe more village level or city level governments uh, uh, is, uh, has to uh, play the more active role and so forth. So uh, this is one of the areas where the institutional reform is, um, might be uh, taking place. And they would have a role model with the Niigata earthquakes of 2004, 2007, which were much more rural in nature. And, right. But the same idea of using planners to serve as an intermediary, working with neighborhood groups, and then working back with the city and almost negotiating is something that's now taken off in Japan. They used it really heavily in 1995, and they're going to continue probably to use it here. Well, I hope you will join me in thanking our three speakers and those of you who've been here for two nights. Uh, congratulations, and please uh, join me in thanking all of the uh, speakers for the last two nights. So. For more, please visit us at stanford.edu.